Wait, can, can I record? Yeah. All right. This is it. We're here. <laughs> Check this out. Look at this. This is like triggering. I got water. It's called liquid death. Doesn't it look like a beer. <laughs> that that look, that's water. That is a that is an edgy water. That's like a badass can of water. It's liquid that is, death. It's that is cool. not your grandma's water. You know, that's fucking. Well, it's water that has alcohol in it. Um, oh, it does have alcohol. No, no, I'm kidding. It's oh. called Mountain Water, Murder Your Fist. This episode is brought to you by Liquid Death. <laughs> it's great for alcoholics. I wish they had it when I quit drinking. It's just water that's it's, branded in an edgy way. In a yeah, it's just way. water in a can. But if you're in uh, recovery or whatever, you can hang out and be like, yeah, fuck you. Woo. Oh, so that's this, this is actually for like alcoholics who can feel like badass kind of while drinking it? I think it's just cool water i don't think it's really for alcoholics but it's just cool Mm -hmm. it's it's what they have at the omaha funny bone uh colleen the the owner her son is uh he's like part of the business but it's pretty fucking cool it's got a skull on it i didn't want to shit on it first i'm trying to work there at some point you know like i don't you know you really tricked me into shitting on it oh we're making jokes (laughs) i'm uh, making fun of the son's product um I'm uh yeah I'm uh I just drove back from Boston I'm this is a mess uh for me I'm in Caitlin's room she's not even oh here I broke in this is Caitlin and Steve's room How, you knew it right away by the way no you said it on the phone dum dum <laughs> oh, I didn't just okay. recognize Caitlin's bedroom <laughs> trying to get me in trouble <laughs> um, can I tell you just okay so we we were supposed to do we were off for three weeks yes three weeks. <laughs> And in that time, we were supposed to watch, I guess, I mean, four Jack Nicholson movies. Here's the thing that's funny about this. I was worried because I watched The Last Detail so long ago that I was like, I don't even remember. It's not even fresh anymore. And you just went ahead and didn't watch it at all. (laughs) I mean, like weeks. It's a two hour movie. It's like an hour and 45 minutes long. And it's been weeks, nor did you watch five easy pieces. <laughs> we're, we're still talking about a Three bunch weeks. of technical. Okay, so I have a problem where I wait to the last minute. And this weekend, I was going to watch both five easy pieces and, and uh, last detail. And, but I had to drive to Boston to do a show. And somehow, and I should have just taken the fucking bus because I could have watched it on the bus. But instead, I drove and it was just an insane. I had to do like a Zoom show in between shows, and it was just insane. And someone, the, the person who ran the thing, said they had a place for me afterwards, and they didn't. And I had to like, fi- well, I had to like find some one friend's cousin and like call them at two in the morning for me to come in. So basically, I drove home today at nine a.m. still having to watch two movies, and I watched Easy Rider in the car. Well, let me ask you. That. I drove. I drove while watching Easy Rider. Well, first of all. I don't want to give away my take, but Easy Rider is a piece of shit. You should have oh, watched one worst. of the good ones. I mean, you could have just gone Easy Rider stinks, whatever. But also, are you what kind of microphone is that? It's got a little. This is my mic. This is my. Oh yeah, this is my mic. Light I, on it. I don't have a. I'm in, I'm in Caitlin's room. I broke in. I'm I'm the, the laptop's on a a ladder, and I can't. I don't even have my stand, so I'm just I'm holding the mic. I think the sound might be good for once because I'm actually holding the mic. Oh yeah, good point. But your Wi-Fi might be funky. Oh. Oh shit. Am I freezing or are you? You froze. I froze because you froze to me. Well, you froze to me. But I mean, what do we? <laughs> Whatever. Just keep on going. All right. I'm in a hotel, but I paid for the good Wi-Fi. I paid the fucking 60 bucks or something. I'm at Caitlin's place. I think she's got good Wi-Fi. Steve makes that Brian Regan money. I think she, I think we got good Wi-Fi here. But, you know, what? Steve and Caitlin moving into my apartment on uh, Tuesday. I know. I'm glad they still have this place. So I could. I had to drive back after I f- watched Easy Rider while driving. I mean, I literally had it on the like in the car. I've like, had I'm people. Saying, I've had people what? pick me up on the road while watching a movie. They're just watching <laughs> Batman, and I'm like, All right. oh shit. Uh, we have the worst podcast, I think. What well, happened? The, the bike fell. I'm the best. The bike fell out of the thing for a second. <laughs> I just want you to know I jeopardize people's lives to, to at least watch, you know, that. You jeopardize people's lives to watch the most overrated <laughs> film in the history of American it film. It is truly the dumbest fucking movie. Should we talk, start with Easy Rider? I guess so. We're already talking about it. It's going to upset people because pe- some people fucking love this movie. I mean, such morons. You know, it was funny. I was listening, <laughs> I was listening to uh, Unspooled. You know, Unspooled is Paul Shear's show. No, I don't know who about Paul Shear is. Yeah, you know Paul Shear, don't you? Paul Shear, the uh, he used to be in that sketch show. It says he's in Sorry. 
No. Okay, well, anyway, nothing. he's like a famous guy, and they have a film podcast. I just listened to a different film podcast than us. And other film podcasts, people are very polite. He's just like, the woman on is just like, is it okay if I find Easy Rider just like a little self-indulgent? Is that wrong? Like, that's how... That's how like other podcasts are like so afraid to say it. Meanwhile, we're just like, this is the worst movie ever. You're a fucking moron. But I truly believe that. Well, I'm not calling people fucking morons, but I do think younger people, people our age and younger that watch it and are like, I love this movie. It's because they've been told that it's great. I really suspect right. that because I watch this movie. And first of all, Dennis Hopper, he stinks. He's fine. He's fun. And, he's fine. He's fun and cool hand, Luke. Uh, Cause he's young and weird. He's like a retard and cool hand Luke. I think everyone was so high in the sixties. They just thought Dennis Hopper was talented. Like that was the level of high where they're like Dennis Hopper's a genius when he's just a high psychopath. Like, every story about him is him. Take, he's always taking a gun out at, at like every situation. <laughs> he's like always like taking a gun out, having a knife fight with rip torn. He's a fucking psychopath. And people just think he's a visionary genius. I think he's whatever in, in uh, <coughs> speed, which we discussed last time, but I think he's great in Apocalypse Now because he's playing himself. He's playing like a drugged up crazy person that's like stuck on an island, which is just him. And when yeah. you watch the making of it, it's even him being like, what do I say? I don't know. He's not even paying attention to Coppola. <laughs> I don't like he's the, that he comes from a time where everyone's high when they're doing everything. Like they're just like that whole movie. They're just on acid and weed the whole time making it. And like. I think that's a bad way to make a movie. I, I don't know. I, I, I think like <laughs> I think, yeah, I'm going to stand on a platform and say not having a good sense of reality <laughs> is a bad way to make a movie. But have you seen it before? Easy Rider? Yeah. No, I thought I'd just come in hot with this fucking <laughs> outside the box. Take. Yeah. <laughs> I know you've seen it. I know you just saw it, but you saw it before this, right? Or yeah, right on. I'm a film buff. <laughs> of course, I've seen Easy Rider. Well, the way you said it stunk, it felt like it was like a new, like a uh, feel like you had just, you know. Well, I have to say it's liberating because <clears throat> I was one of the people I'm talking about. That's how I know. You spot it, you got it, we say sometimes. If you're noticing behavior in people, it's because you probably do this behavior. Right. So when I was a young whippersnapper, uh, a teenager, I was getting into movies and I went to the New York Film Academy and I studied with Miss Cavill at Whitman Hanson and I studied film and whatever. We watched Easy Rider and you're told it's this genius movie that changed the game. And I understand it did usher in the new Hollywood or whatever, because in the 50s and 60s, you had these big studio films on yeah. a lot and it was like dancing and like stick them up and this was raw and real and out in the uh, highway or whatever and th those kinds of movies were new so i understand that after watching this again i'm all for the studio movies give me hello dolly off of this shit give me fucking whatever sound of music after this fucking nonsense this movie sucks and not like you know how you're old you know how like you get older and you like relate to a different character in the movie. You know what I mean? Yeah. I now relate to the guys uh, trying to kill them and murdering them. I'm like, I think they're off to sell. I think they're correct. There's these, these, these people are so annoying. Like, first of all, these actors made a movie about how they're so unique and how they're so unique. They're going to have to get killed because society just can't handle them. Is that not the most narcissistic thing in the world? Yeah. I mean, beyond that, it's just, first of all, the way they die at the end is just makes stupid. No it doesn't sense. even make sense. <laughs> like they're the... just exploding. First of all, like, first, <laughs> they act like they're rebels, but they're not doing anything. They just have long hair and they're riding around. They're actually selling drugs. They're not, there's no like fighting the man thing happening. So usually when you rebel, like if you get killed, you usually rebel for something. They're not doing that. But apparently in the South, there's these just rednecks who when they see a hippie, they just murder them. By the way, they have like kind of long hair. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, I know. Dennis Hopper doesn't even, he just looks like a regular Texan. Yeah, and Peter Fonda <laughs> just has like pretty, it's like longish, it's like 1964 long, but it's not 1969 long. Well, that's kind of hilarious about the movie now. Like you watch it, like they actually just look like, they kind of look like rednecks I'd be scared of. If I went to the, like if I saw Dennis Hopper, I'd be like, that's a redneck who's about to kill a Jew. You know? Right. It, well, the, the thing is, and this is the one knock on the movie usually, but people are usually like four stars, unbelievable, insane, insane. but then they're also like, it lacks a little bit plot, <laughs> not a great plot. <laughs> there, <laughs> like, is, there is no story. I think this out of any movie 
has like what is try to tell me the story right now just like like try to so even like the story is and i'm being like genuine <laughs> they sell coke but it's not tricky or scary they just have coke we don't know where they got the coke. i guess it came off a plane or they came off a plane i guess i think doesn't does it come back in by the way you think it's gonna get tie in just that's just the opening that's it's it. a mcguffin yeah, it's a MacGuffin, sure. <laughs> but so they or, or just bad writing, sure. They they have the coke. They smuggled the coke. Now someone's gonna get mad at me here because they're gonna be like, "You don't get it. They smuggled the coke on the plane." But I would have liked to have seen that. That would be neat. Them coming from fucking Brazil or whatever with cocaine and f- a couple of hookers would have been interesting. But yeah. so they sell it to the Wall of Sound guy. What's his name? Uh, uh, uh Phil Spector. Yeah. So they they sell it to Phil Spector. And he's in like a Rolls Royce and he drives away. They take the cash or they wait. Are they selling Coke or buying Coke? No, they have the cash. They're, se- they're selling Coke and now they have the cash. They have the cash. They hide the cash. Then they ride their that's motorcycles. That's the, that's the end to, of that story. <laughs> to Mardi Gras. They're trying yeah. to get to Mardi Gras. And then they smoke weed and they do Coke. Now, this episode <laughs> is about young Jack Nicholson, early Jack Nicholson. And he's amazing. He's the he, highlight of the movie. He's, he is why the movie, I actually think he's like, he steals the show so much. I think that made people like the movie. Like without him, you would have been like, what the fuck is this? He is so funny. He's doing something very different than what he usually does. He's like, has a voice. Like, right, you know, right. It's like a Southern version of his voice. But no, he's great. And he's like a character. He's like goofy and funny. Meanwhile, these two assholes take themselves so seriously. Like, if, imagine if you had two friends, right? who made a movie where they're just riding around and then they get killed because people can't take out like unique. They are. You would be like, those friends are the biggest douchebags to perceive themselves that way. And then the way that they get killed, it's like an accident. The guy takes out a gun and he's like, I'm going to scare him. But then the gun goes off. Is that what happens? Yeah. But the idea is ultimately that like, you know, even though they, they're still, they, they, they're basically getting killed for, for being hippies, even right. though, by the way, <laughs> I mean, like, I understand, like, I understand a movie where you're like fighting against civil rights and you get killed. Right. Yes. But people don't typically just shoot a white, another, a fellow white guy just because they have long hair. I don't know what version of them. Like, I don't know what coastal elitist bullshit they think where like a Southern guy just sees a guy with long hair. It's like, you know what? Let's go uh, murder them tonight. In the campfire for having broad, long hair. <laughs> yeah, broad, broad daylight. Oh, the, they, the shoot two, on the, the and, highway. <laughs> and then I don't know why they beat Jack Nicholson. Work like the other two are kind of fine. <laughs> like they're just no, like, oh, they're not fine. Peter Fonda takes a couple seconds to wake up after getting right. punched. With the, there's like he has to smack him a little in the face, and then he's like, oh, okay. Um, I also love how they. <laughs> first of all, for those of you who haven't seen it. You're thinking, well, why do they kill Jack Nicholson? Did he fuck someone's daughter? No, no, no. They all walked into a diner, sat down. Everyone was like, look at these pieces of shit. They got uncomfortable, left, and everyone in the diner was like, we should kill them tonight. Yeah, and somehow, <laughs> somehow they found him. They knew where somehow they were they staying. Found they found him. They beat the shit out of one guy, in particular, the guy who's the least hippie rebel, the guy who's like a Southern lawyer. They beat him to death the worst. Who they wake him? up, he's dead, and you don't even, like, kind of find out he's dead. He's just, like, not in the movie anymore. They're like, we got to find out his mother. We'll, well bring they, him his money. They care so little, you don't realize it at first. They care so little about him. You're like, wait, did he die? And also, like, I know he gets beaten to death, but he dies very, like, there's no waking up. They're just like, boom, 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 and then he's just, like, dead. And then you're like, I know they're hippies, but a murder just happened. Are you not going to call the police? Yeah. No, <laughs> are, you gonna, are you not going to avenge? Are you not going to, like, I know they're hippies, but, like, someone was murdered. Yeah, it's weird, too, <laughs> because what's interesting, too, is, like, I think of hippies as, like, uh, you know, living in a fucking um, commune, which they go and visit one at one point. Young Bridget Fonda is in there, from what I understand. Yes. But uh, even that's long and boring and, and okay. stupid and silly. But also, for some reason, I guess this is not, like, a critique I just don't think of hippies on like choppers. Those feel like two different groups. And maybe it's because of the way things are now that like things yeah. are so divided. A hippie person is like in, uh, you know, wearing skinny jeans and drinking a co- cappuccino. What's that called? Cappuccino. cappuccino. 
in a fucking uh, coffee shop and a guy on a bike is not a He's hipster. Like, yeah, Hell's Angels. Yeah, um, that's a good point. And like I said, like they're like, we're hippies. Everyone thinks that we're homos or whatever. Meanwhile, they're like Dennis Hopper has a knife and a cowboy hat and a bicycle. Like I'm like, that's not what I imagine as a hippie. But maybe like back then it was maybe originally biker was like counterculture. Yeah, I but then it was like so. I guess James Dean was was he he rode bikes or Marlon Brando? I guess that's kind of counterculture. I oh, yeah, I don't eventually, know. Eventually, we have to talk about James Dean. I, I've seen all three or four of his movies. I guess it's three. I think, and um, he's just doing Brando. It's wild. Yeah, I did yeah. some like research, and I was like, oh, okay, everyone's saying that. I, I was watching, being like, no, no, no he's just literally, this? he's literally just doing Brando. Yeah, it's like unbelievable, blatant. But what Brando did is so great that like just someone else doing a lesser version is still pretty good. I guess so. Is, is there a truck backing up in the living room? <laughs> It's like that Louie episode where the garbage man oh, I love it. Into, that is one of the funniest things ever. I mean, I think it's outside. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I, I, mean, I think it's outside also. I mean, I, I mean, it's outside. <laughs> but yeah, I don't understand. Like, I don't understand what um, what this movie is like. I don't understand that. I mean, I guess it's just trying to be abstract. But like the idea of them murdering him and then them not calling the police and then them moving on and them getting killed. But like. And it's also like they're white guys. You know what I mean? They're not like black people in the South or. Or the fuck or, is uh, that? I'm so glad they're moving. <laughs> Caitlin kind of lives in the um, not a great neighborhood. Um, yes, I know. But well, uh, I convinced them to move. Is Chloe and Jeff there, too? Yeah. God, Jesus fucking Christ. It's like uh, <laughs> it's like uh, the wire out there. I don't know. Like, like, it's just like. Um, there's no, it's call. bad news bears. I went there once and they kept being like, you guys got to come back over. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sure. Or you could move to my neighborhood. I'm telling you, every, nothing this weekend's working out. This is going to, oh no, stop. I think um, there's a gunshot. It'll be fine. The people, everyone will get used to it. They'll just go, this is annoying. But that's what they've yeah. done with you. So I'm, sh- I'm sure they won't say anything negative or insulting about it in the comments. Um, I can't imagine. <laughs> By the way, it's been so long since we put an episode out. I forgot I know. all about how much people hate us. <laughs> I know, it's been so long and the fact that this episode opens with me it's like three weeks i was like i haven't watched any of the movies this is like a real rock bottom for the pod but we're gonna come back strong it's unbelievable i can't even i thought you were kidding i just assumed (laughs) you were joking and then you're like no i'm kidding you know i told you i wasn't i told you i was gonna do five i told you i was gonna do easy rider uh one flew over cuckoo's nest and um and uh uh five easy pieces i said i probably wouldn't get the last detail so in my mind i only didn't watch one but we're still talking about the other ones what was insane about that part though the reason we were gonna do early nicholson is because like i just happened to watch the last detail wouldn't this be fun well i got an idea i'll watch all of them but the one you just watched (laughs) i got an idea all right you ready for this yes our first patreon we talk about the last detail and five easy pieces yeah, that'll get people jumping on the picture. <laughs> two, two movies that 11 people have seen. Why? I mean, then why have it all? Be, no, that's the, where the Patreon should be. It should be the niche shit, you know? Great movies, by the way. Both of them. I got all these. I got pages of notes on <laughs> I don't want to hear it. I haven't seen that. All right. But we'll I'll talk. I'll watch it. it. We'll do a Patreon. Last anyway. Detail is amazing. It's so funny. It's Nicholson at his best. He's so good. But anyways, let's talk more about Easy Ride, which piece of shit. I hate those dumb <laughs> cuts they do too where it's like ooh, ah, ooh, ah. it's like a student film it's embarrassing no this movie feels like they had the dailies and a bunch of raw footage and they just showed that as a movie like it seems like it's just the random dailies it feel it doesn't it's not here's the thing i don't think it's a movie like it's not a movie it's a random it's a random assortment of them looking cool on the highway with a good soundtrack and then a uh, part where they're tripping. They're just, literally, it's a movie where they're like, all right, the third act will just be us literally tripping. And then I'll say shit about my actual mother, even though I'm pretending to be a character in this movie. And, and like, I mean, like, it's not a real, to me, it's not even a movie. Well, and each one of their stops sucks. Like when they're in the commune, it sucks. When they're in the fucking, uh, they're having the trip in, in New Orleans, that whole thing sucks. I had to like fast forward. I was like, oh, I hate this. And it's a movie I always pretended to like because you're supposed to like it. And I, I don't understand what the thing is. I guess generationally, again, if you were watching all those old, but there's great movies from that time period it's, that are like, great. 
people like it because it's pandering. It's pandering to this idea of the unique hippie. So when people watch it, they're like, yeah, that's me, man. I'm unique. I'm living on the edge and society can't handle me. Meanwhile, the movie made fucking $600 million. So obviously, like, obviously, like, hippies aren't this niche group. Like, obviously, enough of them were there to, like, feel represented. But it's pandering representation. It's just, it's just like, hippies at the time felt like this movie represented them. And you know what? It did, but it represented the worst parts about them. It represented the, the there's two parts about being a hippie. And one part's good, like, political activism. And the other part is just complete, like, self-worship and, like, self-indulgence uh, and, like, taking yourself too seriously. And this panders to the worst aspects of that, you know? Yeah, I agree. And the music is great. I mean, sure, the yeah, is great. Born to be wild is like amazing. But you could also yeah. just play that while lo looking at footage of people on motorcycles going down a highway. Like you don't have to like watch a whole movie to capture that. Yes, I love motors. I like photos of motorcycles. I just I, I like I like a motorcycle, but I it's just think it, there's, there's there's just no plot and. Also, I'm like, is Peter Fonda good? Did someone say he was good at some point? He's just whatever. He's just bland. He's just there's no uh, depth to any of the characters. There's no real conflict. The, the deaths are ridiculous. It's just Nicholson. It's the Nicholson show, which is who Nick we're here to talk about. Yeah, I mean, Nicholson's amazing. He's got the, the or whatever thing. That's great. He's got no, he is awesome. And he he, by the way, is the only one actually he's a lawyer for the ACLU. So he's actually the only one really actually helping people. Like, right, right. They think being a hippie is just riding down a highway looking cool. The movie is almost like a parody, except it takes itself seriously. It's not, but like he's actually helping people. The part of counterculture that's like, I guess, meaningful that this movie never like really talks about, you know? Yeah, and it feels like you can you can feel or sense the writing or the lack of writing or the, the yeah. creative like like I could just picture him being like, like Hopper being like, we'll do like a cut back and forth in between yeah. segues. Like it'll just cut back. And then someone's like, yeah. And he's, it puts it in and it was, like, this is stupid. It was a movie made by people so high. They had no self doubt and probably didn't have self doubt at all. Like if it was a movie made, you feel like it's a movie made by people who said whatever idea came to them, they thought that idea was genius. And, and I would that was just like the whole movie. If people are going to come, if people are going to hate us, they're going to be upset about this because it's such a popular movie, but Please explain in the comments what is great. Just genuinely, what is fun about it? What makes you want to rewatch it? Other than maybe it's fun because you're like, I want to get on the highway and just go. But for that, you could watch like one clip of it and be excited and end. <laughs> or just go on the highway. Just go on the. Just take the Easy Rider soundtrack and go on the highway, and that will be better than just watching this movie. This movie also like isn't actually about anything. It's about like these abstract ideas, but nothing literal. The whole tagline is they're searching for America. But it's like, what does that mean? They're just go like, it's just like, it's just all vague fucking ideas for people. It's like, it's like a vague for people just like, let's just go and be free. And you're like, what does that mean? He's like, you know, man, you know what I mean? Like it's for people. It's a movie by people who don't know how to articulate anything because they're dumb. Yeah, and I think there's movies better at that that have done that looking for America thing or, or yeah. trying to depict it like the movie boyhood has nothing to do with any of this but it feels much more like an in search of the soul of america of, to me to like follow of course yeah a family all the way up through and going to college and divorce and all these things i mean that's that's so substantial so much substance this, this has none of that this movie is like that hippie thing where it's like either you get it or you're square. And if you have to ask what it's about, then you're square. And that's this whole movie. This whole movie is like, man, if you don't get it, then that's just, you're just a fucking square, you know? Well, I'm a fucking square. I'm sober and I'm a square. And I think this movie's fucking retarded. Yeah, I'm not a square. I'm cool and I'm hip and I, mean, I get things and I know <laughs> things. And this movie sucks. So how about that? But I do agree that you are a square. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, it's also like, the idea that they're like martyring themselves in the movie is just so self-important. The fact that they're like, they're, they're you know, I, I know you say I get too biographical, but they clearly see themselves as those characters, you know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That, and the just... fact that, yeah. And the fact that they see themselves as, as people who are so, who get killed for looking for freedom. You know what I mean? The fact that they view themselves as being martyred by society is just an insane level of arrogance. It stinks. But as we're talking Jack Nicholson, he's great. And it is the fun thing about that movie is you can like see 
the birth of a star. I mean, Nicholson had been in a few things here and there, whatever, but that movie, you watch it and you're like, who's this guy? I mean, I was imagining watching it if I hadn't seen the few things that Nicholson had done at that point and just being like, what's up with this guy? I mean, it is like a, a star making performance. And you know, you know, Nicholson's great because all his early movies where he's in it for like 10 minutes, all the covers always just have him on it. Like, like right. Easy Rider covers him. <laughs> and then, uh, and then the cover for, I don't know if you saw the original Little Shop of Horrors. It's just him now, even though right. he's like three minutes. Like he just kind of like, he, you know what it is? It's kind of like, you know what he's like? He's like a comic where if no one can follow them, they just become a headliner because that's just like they no one can follow them. He stole the show to the point where like he just had to be the star, you know? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he stands out and he stands out in this movie. He's the one highlight of the movie. He's the best character in the movie. It's the best performance in the movie. It's the funniest part of the movie. It's the most memorable. It's the only the funny like nothing. This movie is also just so not funny. It takes uh, itself so seriously. I agree. But the uh, oh, I've got a helmet. I got a beauty. And it cuts him. <laughs> he's wearing like a fucking high school football helmet. It's almost like he like like, yeah, it's like he is so much better than this movie. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. And then this would be a great place to segue into Five Easy Pieces, which came out the following year, where he or, was tremendous. Or One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest. Since yeah, which came out six years later after he had already <laughs> um, been nominated for Best Actor several times. But I'll just say he's amazing in the last detail. It's hilarious. It's beautiful. It's sad. And Five Easy Pieces, both of those movies have like these terribly sad, beautiful endings that we'll talk about another time. That's a, no, no, on the Patreon. That's a teaser. All right, great. We're teasing. What if we, we do the Patreon, discussed the Patreon have... before this? But <laughs> what if we do the Patreon? I still haven't seen it, and I'm just <laughs> but people paid money. Um, Phenomenal movies, but I, I guess we should go to Chinatown if we're going sequentially. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay, yeah. Let's, well, or we can talk about one flew over cuckoo's nest since it is kind of like a counterculture thing. Okay. All right, we can do that. I mean, by the way, these have been sprung on me. Chinatown. <laughs> I haven't watched Chinatown in about three years. <laughs> And Ranon called me frantically while driving to his girlfriendish house to tell me I have to talk about Chinatown, which I've seen 25 <laughs> times, but not in three years. I didn't think it was a, I, I, you watch movies like the way I listened to Dylan. I just saw you had it all fucking memorized. I, I didn't realize, you know, like. Yeah, oh. well, I got Cuckoo's Nest. I mean, Cuckoo's Nest, I can talk about. It's it's the best. Well, let's talk about Cuckoo's Nest because I'm excited to talk about it. All right, great. Let's go. Let's talk about Cuckoo's Nest, which I also haven't watched in a minute. Oh, actually, <laughs> I watched it on my birthday last year because I get movie choice on my birthday and Sarah scrolls her phone while I watch Cuckoo's Nest for the 500th time. <laughs> well, yeah, there you go. I Well, first of all, like I, I watched it uh, this week and uh, it's a great movie, but it is hilarious how like... Uh, <laughs> You're going to call me a douche right away. But you know how you watch a movie, you're like, oh, let's see how this works in this today's climate, you know? Oh, God. Well, it's just hilarious how, like, problematic it is right away. Do you know well, what I'm talking about? Well, I've talked about <laughs> this before recently. I, I, I love I, the movie, I, by the way. I'm just I saying. might have brought up on the show. Yeah, it's in my top ten. But it is, um, I think we might have talked about this on the show, or I was talking to someone about it. It is amazing. Like, he is in prison for <laughs> fucking a 15-year-old girl. Raping totally, her. I totally <laughs> forgot about that. Like, like he's like, like the <laughs> hero, and, then, and it's also not like not only the statutory it's it's statutory rape, but the movie's not about that. That's just color. That's just like providing color right. for the character. Like, but anyway, the opening scene, he goes in, and, the, <laughs> and this is the first time you really meet him, so you want to like like him, and you know, this is introducing us to his hero. And the the head of the mental institution goes, "Now I see you're in uh, jail for a." Uh, statutory rape and he just goes yeah but she was 15 going on 35 if you know what i mean and when you get your face into that red beaver it's just like, it's like the opening and then he immediately says that and then he really goes up to the chief the native american and goes what is this guy deaf that's the first the first 10 minutes is him not just admitting to fucking a 50 year old girl but going like you would have done the same thing <laughs> like and then immediately doing this to a native american to his face <laughs> i mean first of all that is not the opening scene i mean he walks in first they unbuckle him and everything he kisses a, the guard yeah yeah it's a few minutes in but <clears throat> no it is uh it is a thing that wouldn't fly uh now obviously <laughs> he did fuck you get that little red beaver but this is what we talk about though this weird context it has changed. I mean, that this is like a, 
a thing that like back then the movie won every Oscar. I mean, it swept the Oscars, one of three movies ever to do that. The first movie in 50 years at that time to do it or 40 years. Yeah. Um, no, so it just was an acceptable thing then that like, ah, guys, fuck teenagers. What are you going to well, do? I mean, I, I mean, I don't even accept he was in jail, but I guess it was like a kind of jail thing that you could. Um, yeah, it seemed like the kind of thing where like, you know, what it is like the asshole in the comedy does something, but it's funny. It seemed like that, that like statutory rape back then was like, well, he's a he's a hard case. You know what I mean? He's, he's wild. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that. It, um, yeah. So it's definitely had a shift. I mean, they never even really bring it up again. But also there is humor. The movie's aware that that's funny. He says, no man in the world. You get that little red beaver, no man in the world. And it cuts to a guy who's just looking at him kind of like, come well, on. Their, their relationship is one of the funniest relationships in the movie. The, him and uh, that guy. The warden <laughs> kind of guy, whatever. You didn't weigh the chain, did you? No, I didn't. <laughs> The Warner guy is just so unfazed by everything. And then Jack Nicholson is just saying so many inappropriate things to him. And he's just like being under, it's just so funny. The relationship, he, like Jack Nicholson is just giving him lip service and he doesn't seem to care that much. Like yeah. Jack Nicholson is just, he's just like, you know, between me and you, uh, uh, nurse ratchet's a bit of a cunt. Don't you think? <laughs> and he's like, well, um, why do you think he's, that? <laughs> he's one of the finest nurses we have. Um, <laughs> No, there seems to be this weird level of respect. It feels like back then, though, men were with the men. You were like, yeah, man, I'm a man. I get it. I mean, I under I'm not going to condone it. But yeah, you fuck a teenager if you yeah. can. And uh, and she's a cunt. I get you. Like, it did feel yeah, like this, a respect level between the two of them. He's definitely never like, hey, watch your mouth. That's a, you know, that's a very respected employee here. He's just like. Well, I, I beg to differ, but I understand where you're coming from. You know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, it's so, their well, relationship is so funny. He also, another great moment with them is there's the Indian doctor who says, um, what do you mean? And then Nicholson turns to the guy and goes, I'm smarter than him. And the, and the warden kind of nods. He's like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he's, like, <laughs> he's just like, yeah, we just need an Indian on the staff. I hear you. Like, he's just like, <laughs> nod he's just nodding. Yeah, it's, yeah, no, that's hilarious. That part's great. That part's Harder amazing. Than him, aren't I? It's just the best movie. I mean, that character, it's uh, again, it's in my my top 10 and I could make a case for it being my number one favorite movie. It's my favorite movie to watch with people for the first time to show people. And I've probably told this story before, too. But my best friend, Derek, in high school, I was like, he's like, ah, I don't want to watch it. It looks weird. You know, it's just it's an old movie. And I said, I will bet you one hundred dollars if you watch this movie. It will be in your top five favorite movies ever. And if it's not, you got to answer honestly, I'll give you a hundred dollars. And he was like, okay, deal. And then we watched the movie. And of course the, I owed him the hundred bucks because he said he didn't like it, but oh, no, really? no. no, that's not the oh. ending. He was like, oh man, keep your money. He's like, that's my favorite movie. It's just the best. It's so was fucking doing, good. Was he doing pretty well financially at that point? No, I mean, we're I probably high school. I mean, I would have lied just to get the money. That seems like a no brainer. Yeah, yeah, you're a no brainer, is right? You got <laughs> no morals either. I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I would have really needed a hundred dollars at that point. Um, I mean, I would have just convinced you know, but uh, you spoiled my story <laughs> and my podcast. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, no, it's you hate it. Tell me what you hate about it. I, I, I'm trying to figure out how to formulate this without you fucking hating me, you know what I mean? Um, I think it is a very powerful movie. And I think, let me just say the good things first. I think it's a really powerful movie. I think one of the reasons um, it is so powerful is that even though it is a movie about like, you know, rebelling against authority, you know, the film is actually, the tone of it is a very lyrical, melancholy tone. And I think that's what makes it so powerful. It's not filmed in this rebellious, fuck you man kind of way. It's filmed in a very melancholy way as if the movie's kind of mourning his death the whole time, you know? The music is just kind of like, I don't know, very much mournful. So I think that you're looking at me like, a, you know, what I, I mean, you that? bust out lyrical mournful. I mean, what the fuck? What? 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 You've been in school since the last time we <laughs> met up. Is that why you couldn't watch the movies? What? Lyrical it's, mournful. What like the, the fuck does either of those mean? Because the music is like it has this like melancholy tone and there's scenes in it that are just like. Like the scene where he's watching TV and, and well, they can't watch a baseball game and he's pretending to do all the players. Yes. And they're playing the music. It's a beautiful scene. It's a lyrical scene. One of the great scenes of all time. I mean, there's no lyrics. I don't the music is <laughs> instrumental. 
it's, it's it's a poetic. There's a what are you acting like you've never? I mean, it's a poetic. Uh, it's a mournful. Yeah, there's like a mournful tone to it that I think is very powerful. Like you know, because well, he is like there's a certain point where he is like aware of his own death. You know. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's a sad movie in that like, and R. P. McMurphy is defeated in the movie. He doesn't well, win. He, well, he, he's, I mean, there's, so there's like, all right, so let's talk about the mythology of the movie. There's, he is essentially like a Jesus figure, right? He dies to liberate other people. And so they're using that mythology, but, but what's, and they do the same thing in Shawshank Redemption with Tim Robbins. He's essentially like, you know, the figure who like redeems people. But the difference is Tim Robbins is like, in my opinion, just kind of a boring sage. While what's right. so hilarious about One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest is the Jesus figure is such a degenerate, you know? Yeah. And that's what makes him such a great character. He's a statutory raping drug use. Not that I condone that, but it's just like the Jesus symbol is such a fucking degenerate, which that contrast is amazing. But this guy who is so, it's the idea of Jesus as being someone connected to his impulses and not feeling guilty about them, you know? Right. And what's interesting too is he liberates these guys, but only. Kind of. I mean, like Chief breaks out at the end, obviously, but Billy Bibbit is not going to be OK. No, no, he does not I liberate. Mean, Billy Bibbit. <laughs> I mean, he fucked Billy. Billy's fucked. And then the other guys are all still going to be there. I mean, they might know a little bit more about baseball or be a little bit. Happy, oh, of course. But none of them are getting out. It's. I mean, yeah, it, he liberates Chief ultimately. But what is powerful is that this guy who loves life and loves to like indulge in his impulses and love a guilt-free life that this guy would do something as kind of courageous as because what's so powerful is he, he has the opportunity to escape and right. he chooses not to, and he knows what's going to happen. He chooses not to, to like avenge Billy Bitt's death and like kind of martyr himself to like show, you know, that, that's the symbolism of the movie to show like to finally give chief his push to get out, you know? Yeah, that's an interesting thing, because, I mean, that's such a fascinating moment there. And that's like that weird long shot on him just sitting there thinking or whatever. What's the train? You mean the night before, right before he passes out? Or you mean? Yes. The yeah. That part's incredible. Cause to me, it's to me. I don't know. For me, that part felt like he had a premonition of his death. Well, it just feels like it's not going to end well. I mean, it's yeah. like he has actually been defeated by the system and um, Ratchet. Well, he also could like, I don't know, for me, it's like he could have left right then, but he chose it. First, he chose to have Billy to have sex with the woman, you know? Right, right. And then he's sitting there and like there's a little secret that comes into it, like a thought that we're not aware of. You know what I mean? Right. And he kind of yeah. smiles, but a little sadly. It's an amazing moment. And then you hear a train in the distance, which to me is kind of like a symbol of death, like the train taking away from this life, you know? But I do think on some level he kind of sees his fate on some cosmic level coming up, you know, his fate, his fate to be the guy who martyrs himself, you know? Well, and also, I mean, there could also be a thing. I mean, it's up for interpretation of that. For sure. Of course. That uh, maybe he's like, uh, this is actually kind of working out for me. I like it here. I'm the hero of these guys. And maybe he doesn't have such a good go of it out there. He's not as, as cool or as exciting well, or whatever. I, I, th I think in a way we're saying the same thing, right? Like maybe he's like, oh, this is my fate to be in here. But right. But the fate of being in here will ultimately be to, to liberate them. But it's a sacrifice I'm making. Whether he knows right. exactly it's death, I think he's aware of some level that there's going to be a... Because the movie is a sacrifice at the end, you know? Right. I mean, does he know that he's about to be lobotomized? I don't know. It's Yeah, I think it's a little more like um, a premonition, not very specific. But there is that weird moment where the... You know, I mean, it's obviously a weird moment when you're sitting there in the train. You know what I mean? It's a weird, It's a weird spooky moment. And I do think there's... I, I do think on some level, I, I don't think he's like, oh, I just had a vision. I'm going to die. But I do think on some level he realizes he's not going to be leaving. Yeah, it's just not going to work out for him. I mean, they're going to find him also. I mean, you know, if he, even if he escapes, it just doesn't feel like it's going to work out great for him. So he decides to uh, go to sleep for a while. But it's <laughs> it is no. so I mean, we, we went right to the ending, but it is one of the great. I, should we go? Well, whatever. We'll talk about the end and go back. It is one of the great endings because, like, you know, the movie's been a lot of fun and games, you know, and then it gets a little more and more disturbing as it goes on, you know. Um, and then the ending is just so primal and violent and, like, you know, mythological, you know. It's the greatest ending. I mean, the ending ending, the last shots with Christopher Lloyd and 
Christopher it's, Lloyd gives me fucking goosebumps. Like when I watch it, I feel like I literally feel the something about the way Christopher Lloyd is like screaming in that getting seized by that sense of liberation. It makes my whole back like I feel like all the hairs on my back like just stand straight up. Absolutely. And that's what puts it to me forever in my top 10, probably top five, really, because it does something for me that no other movie can even compete with that. And then like the last thing he does where he's doing like, ah! like that's really <laughs> serious. It's unbelievable. It's magical and chief running into the woods. It's just so powerful. And it's everything that movies are supposed to be. There can't be a more magical moment in any movie ever other than maybe uh, in one uh, it's a wonderful life. When he says, you know, my brother, George Bailey, the right. richest man in town. I mean, those two moments are the two moments in movies that hit me every single time without fail. Even though I've seen it a hundred times, I know it's coming. I know because it works on like a level that's just like primal. It works on such a because it, I do think violence can be very moving and shit. And, and the fact there's a couple of things. I mean, the fact that he does have that opportunity to escape in the window makes it so haunting. You know what I mean? The fact that the woman's right outside, you know? And the fact that instead of escaping, he goes in, sees what happened to Billy and then tries to kill her, you know, mm -hmm. the fact that he feels so connected to them at that point, you know, that he would be so um, what do you call it? Uh, selfless, you know? Yeah, he cares. I mean, that's the thing about him is he's kind of this piece of shit. But even when he takes some fishing, I mean, it's it's so magical, which is such a ridiculous one of the funniest sequences of all time. And one of the most powerful lines in that movie is when they're all laughing. He goes, what are you laughing about? You're not nuts. You're fishermen. I mean, that's another yeah. beautiful moment that's so touching. Well, so this is in the genre of the, the guy who liberates a group, right? You have a couple movies like this. You have Dead Poet Society. You have Shawshank Redemption. It's the guy who comes in and kind of makes a group of people see more about what life is really like. You know what I mean? He right. kind of awakens them. But this is by far the best version of that movie because he is such a degenerate. So it gives it this kind of instead of feeling self-important, there's this like irreverence to it where he is a degenerate and yet he is very concerned with liberating their minds and making them enjoy life. He is so concerned with that. Well, or and just, he cares and he's the he real cares. deal. And he understands that maybe it's, it's hard that, that to see these guys. These are like good guys. You know what I mean? And he's like, you guys are, are, are good guys. You should be out there, you know, bird dog and chicks and bang and beaver. Yeah. It means so much to him. As like, as you said, as somebody that seems to enjoy life so much. And now he's fucked up enough that he's kind of in jail, making the best of it. But it's just uh, this idea that you guys aren't criminal. I'm a criminal, I'm a degenerate piece of shit, but you guys are able to fucking go out there and live. He sees the, um, the hope in them and has to act yeah, on he it. He's the uh, he's the you know the 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 hedonist as like a saint you know like Jesus said you know love thy neighbor and his his message is you know your sexual impulses are not wrong even though I guess in this climate it's kind of weird because he's statutory rapist but like he's like you shouldn't feel bad about having sex you shouldn't feel bad about wanting to have fun you know and this gets into the whole symbolism of her which as much as I love the movie I guess this is the one thing. I think the movie's really powerful. I think some of the mythology is kind of inherently a little sexist because it is, it is essentially this cold mother figure who's keeping, who's basically making men feel guilty for their impulses, you know, right. and keeping them down and making them feel guilty. And then the movie's about like, you know, let's break free from the cold woman figure to be men. You know what I mean? There is yes. a, and I, I don't, and I'm, I, I still love the movie, but I do like, there is that interesting watching it now from that perspective and it's definitely like <laughs> this cold woman the mother the mother who keeps men from being men you know yeah it's interesting because I, I see what you mean and other people have uh, pointed that out but also to me it's not uh every woman isn't like uh candy and the other woman are nice regular women the prostitutes but I mean, they're he, like he literally, he literally gets her to fuck uh he literally gets her to fuck the other guy in it but i yeah, will say yeah. this like a movie can be great even if some of the things don't hold up maybe the same way now but, but a movie gonna, can still be great within that you know what i was gonna say is nurse ratchet does feel like a, a, a uniquely evil character i mean i guess she can represent yes. women or whatever or um, or feminism or whatever she represents. But like in it is viable to me that there is one this one woman who's obviously evil, like one of the great monsters of all time. And, you know, the most satisfying moment of the movie is when he's strangling her, which could not be more real, by the way. It is quite 
unpleasant. Yeah. Her eyes are bulging. Well, you know, in the book, apparently he rips out her tits. It's apparently she has really big tits in the book. And like he finally rips open the blouse and the tits are finally free. So oh, oh, I think he meant like he rips emo- like physically like <laughs> penetrates the skin and rips them open. <laughs> no, it's not sounds of the lambs. He just like uh, rips like the blouse and the tits come out, you know? Oh, I see. Well, I could have used that. I would have seen <laughs> Louise Fletcher's titties. She is great. I mean, look, I yeah, some of the mythology is definitely it, it, you get the sense that probably maybe Ken Kesey had an issue with his mother, maybe because it, it does stem from this idea of the mother making you feel guilty for your sexual feelings and trying to break free from that oppression of the mother who's like, what you're doing is dirty. You know what I mean? And breaking free from that guilt, you know. But couldn't she just, is it possible? I don't, I'm not saying this, but isn't it possible that she just represents authority and the system and they just use a woman because a woman is who would be a nurse at a psych ward at that time? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's both. I think she is representing authority, but I also think the idea of the, the woman in power as a frigid woman, you know, the more empowered they are, the more frigid they are. I mean, I do think it makes it more effective from a somewhat, you know, maybe somewhat like sexist perspective but that being said i mean like i think a movie can have issues where you're like yeah that's a little you know you know but it's still like a powerful story either way you know i don't think you know things just don't always fully hold up to modern standards in some way but other parts of it can still be really effective you know i mean obviously things don't nothing holds up and obviously he is he did rape a 15 year old you know what i mean you know, it is a movie about like a Jesus figure who rapes a 15 year old, but it's OK for things not to fully hold up and still appreciate what's great about them. Right. That's my stance. You know, I, I don't feel the need. I don't have to defend everything in a movie. I can see what's great about it, but also just see like, you know, yeah, there's probably some sexist view of women in this that is, um, you know, that doesn't hold up. But I still think the movie is still a powerful story about um, about this guy who is so concerned with liberating these people even you know what i mean the the guy behind the degenerate and the fact that like society is so fucked up that she who is evil is the one who's like respected by society you know right and and he who is like actually the redeemer is considered crazy or, or, or a horrible person to the point where the ultimate flip is that he's murdered and yet it's government sanctioned it's like that's the ultimate flip of how fucked up society is that he's lobotomized and it's completely legal you know right well yeah not murdered but lobotomized i mean chief I mean, murder just, or something yeah but it's ultimately murder. yeah no and that's something they did fucking the kennedy one of the uh kennedy kids was lobotomized which is yeah i mean it's a crazy thing and I, it is like you know the movie works on a literal level but it's like an allegory right for for how like just you know it's it's the the, the uh you know, it's a message that's been done a lot now, but, you know, that the the people who are sane are the ones who are crazy. You know, right. the people who are repressed are the ones who are crazy. And to me, lobotomized is kind of the ultimate, like, oh, this seems normal to, like, work a nine to five and be really bored and not have your own thoughts. It seems normal, but it's actually, like, government-sanctioned murder <laughs> of the yeah, soul. Yeah, well, and now it takes on a new meaning with cell phones feel like uh, the ultimate <laughs> lobotomy of, of yeah. like, the people on TikTok and social media and all these things. And how um, we get so far away from our natural impulses, you know? Right. But let, let's talk about some of the details of some of these amazing <laughs> scenes that are so great. I mean, first yeah. of all, the ending is all this callback, which I, I can still remember seeing this movie for the first time. And that's why I love watching it with people for the first time, because there's so many things that develop so beautifully. And Nicholson trying to lift the water tank or whatever it is, is so great. And you just don't, it's not something you see coming back. Like Easy Rider, you think like, oh, this money is going to be something as it's a <laughs> yeah. MacGuffin. But the, the water fountain thing, you're just kind of like, okay, that was crazy. That was a crazy scene. And it does feel he sells it so well that you are saying, oh, that is impossible. That's ridiculous. Because you yes. see the effort he's putting in. It's not even budging. And he's a strong guy. So yes. it makes it that much more magical and miraculous later on. And you're like, when you first see Chief going in there, you don't know where he's going. He goes to that and starts working it. And you're like, it's, it's like one of the great callbacks in film history. It's a great callback. And you're watching a miracle. It's, it has a religious feeling to it. You're watching Jesus walk on water. You're watching a miracle of him lifting something that can't be lifted. You know what I mean? Right. You're watching a, it, it works on this kind of religious level. No, I think it's, this screenplay is amazing and it's an amazing story. I mean, that's what like easy riders. There is no story. It's just fucking whatever. You know what I mean? Stinks. But like, yeah, this is uh, 
this is like an actual amazing story about this battle between these two people, you know, uh, you know, and this battle over the souls of the people who are there and in the tension of the story where, I mean, the movie never feels like you never feel like you see the, the strings, uh, the, the plot moments. It feels very organic and yet it's a very beautifully structured story. You know, it's also, we should add one of the funniest movies of all yes. time. Like, I mean, top 10 funniest movies. I mean, when he's running, first of all, he's wearing shorts outside of his pants when they're playing basketball. And one of the great lines when he yells, what a ball club. I mean, and Chief Chief coming to life with catching the ball and throwing it out. And then the guard being like, man, fuck that shit. I mean, it's just like classic 70s black guy upset is just hilarious. Well, it's, and it's, when Chief yeah. starts jogging, I mean, you're like, oh, he's come to life. This is magical. And that's even before we find out he can talk, which I want to talk about in a second. Well, that's another thing that's so powerful about the movie. The movie doesn't have a lot of backstory. It has a little but it does make you wonder what's going on with Chief the whole time. You know what I mean? And Jack Nicholson. You really never get fully into their thoughts, and it makes you wonder a lot about their lives. Well, Chief is beautiful because he has that great monologue at the end that's so beautiful, and he talks about his father being an alcoholic, and then he was an alcoholic. And just the idea, you get all you need from Chief is that yes. instead of talking about this pain, he'd rather pretend he can't talk or hear. That's how much pain there is. He wants to he doesn't even want anyone to try to get out of him with the kind of pain he's experienced. And he's a he's you know, he's such a big man, but he feels so small inside. So it's all like how you think of yourself. You know, it's funny. I I do think a lot of the things in the movie, if they were handled by someone else, would feel so corny. You know, the idea of like you're all free. You just don't realize, it. you know, there's a lot of corny ideas, but it's handled in such a perfect like dead, way. Dead Poet like dead Society. Po That's what it I'm sticks. saying. Like, Dead Poets Society things. I feel like all the other versions of this movie are sentimental bullshit. It's just Robin Williams going carpe diem. You know what I mean? But Jack Nicholson is saying carpe diem the whole time too. But it's done in such an irreverent, funny kind of um, manner that it never feels like that that bullshit like movie trying to manipulate your feelings. You know what I mean? I guess maybe because it's hard. It's a hard movie. It's not sentimental. And even though it is, he is trying to have them have fun. There's real... There's real danger in it. That's the other thing. There's real danger. There's a real threat. And right. it's just like, it's just a beautifully filmed movie. Like it's beautifully directed. And the music, like you said, is so good at the end. It's so haunting at the end. And the way the music uh, crescendos as the glass smashes is amazing. And then it just fades to kind of nothing and eerie as he runs into the woods is amazing. Um, the basketball sequence is amazing. But one of the great, great, great reveals and movie moments ever is Chief speaking for the first time, which I've talked about this a lot. And it's one of the great memories of my whole life. My high school girlfriend, who ironically is the sister of my friend Derek, who I talked about, talked about earlier. I remember watching being 17 years old and she was 16 watching this movie for the first time. I was like, you got to see this movie. And I remember where I was sitting on the couch and I had seen it a bunch and she was watching it and she was like laying on her stomach like with her chin in her hands, you know, like a 16 year old girl does. And watching her face light up when Chief does the uh, juicy fruit. And it's one of the great moments of my entire life watching this girl that I was in love with react to Chief revealing that he could talk. And Nicholson's reaction to Chief saying, ah, uh, juicy fruit is just, I mean, can you hear me too? And then immediately... Love it. Nicholson, Love Nicholson's like, what's two guys like us? He knows absolutely nothing about him I except know. that he just conned everybody. And so Nicholson is already like, this is my idol. You faked, you, you fooled him, Chief. He's you fooled them all. So, he's so beautifully non-judgmental in that moment, Jack Nicholson. He doesn't go, what the fuck have you been doing this whole time? He's just like, you're great. Like, he's like, he's like, the, the reaction is so affectionate and so like commiserating that it's just like an amazing, it's just such an amazing, the connection between them is incredible. It's incredible. And that's the movie. And it's amazing because that's what, you know, they do the moment before that. We think they think you might be faking it. And Nicholson does that Nicholson movie star look of like, come on. And then so he sees Chief faking his thing to get out of. And he immediately is connected and goes, what's two guys like us doing in here? And Nicholson knows everything he needs to know about this guy. And right. now they're they're friends and it's just beautiful. But that line, you fooled him, you fooled them all. Uh, Juicy fruit is just amazing and also that chief has seen enough of nicholson to know that i like this guy this is the first guy i could actually trust and and connect with um, yeah, yeah yeah i mean I, I i always think like for me a movie there has to be a connection between two people in a movie you know what i mean that's why any movie where you don't feel like 
you know, as much as I thought Judas and the Black Messiah had interesting stuff, you never feel really a connection between anyone. And to me, at, at every movie's emotional core, there has to be a connection. And the connection between them two is, is so powerful and so much spoken outside of words. You know what I mean? But then when they do speak, it's fucking, I mean, the story he says about his father and how they, society broke him down, which is, by the way, a lot of the same idea as an easy rider. You know what I mean? They're not letting me be, you know what I mean? But it's just handled in such a, such a, I don't know, such a, just a better way of executing a story, you know? Right. I mean, the, the other great chief moment, of course, and then you learn so much more about the moment later is when he finally votes to watch the World Series. Yeah. Which in the moment, you don't know what's going on. You don't know he knows. He just, he just convinced him to raise his hand. But then you find out later that Chief was listening. In that moment, Chief decided, fuck it. I, I guess I will watch the World Series. I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful thing the well, first yeah. time you're seeing it. Well, that's what's so powerful about the movie. It's like the movie doesn't make you connect to these characters, but it doesn't fully let you in which makes you start imagining what they're thinking a lot. You know, it doesn't fully let you into what exactly Jack Nicholson is always thinking, especially at the end in the moment with the train, you know, you don't really fully. And there are moments in it where like, you know, he, in his head, he's probably is like, I really want to show these people a good time, but you don't really see. So you, the movie makes you kind of, you have to go, you have to go, you have to meet them halfway. You can't, it just, it doesn't tell you exactly what they're feeling. You have to, as an audience member, really engage in the movie and really think about what they're thinking in different parts. And it makes you feel connected to them, you know? Right. By trying to reach out, you have to like reach out to them and wonder what this guy's, the Native American, he doesn't like to talk. He's given up on life on some level. You know what I mean? He's too afraid to do anything. The shit he saw his father do really caused some trauma, you know? And it just, it just makes you really like connect with those characters by showing and not telling, you know? Yeah, it's just it's beautiful. And that whole baseball sequence when he's trying to get them to vote and that that moment of well, I've never seen a World Series game. And I, I think I'd like to see one. There, there's such beautiful life moments, life affirming moments. And uh, that come on, let's go. Let's see these hands. And people slowly start raising their hands. It's beautiful. You feel touched by it. It's it's so great. It's all and yeah. then when Nurse Ratchet turns that screw and that's the, kind of the first inkling that she's pretty evil. When she, she's uh, like, it's too late. Sorry. Right, right, right. Well, yeah, exactly. You see that she's like, it's all about control, even though she hides it behind this kind of like calm, like, you know, oh, I'm just trying to, you know, she hides it behind this like normal society shit when she's just such a controlling, crazy. She's just such a crazy person. But also it's, it, it's my kind of what I love in a movie, too, is when something can be both a small thing and a giant thing at the same time. And that vote for the World Series, on one hand, it's just a very small thing in a mental institution, you know? And yet it's also extremely epic and it's a fight for their souls. You know what I mean? I love when something can feel both, you know, like a very trivial thing and the most important thing in the world. Yeah, <clears throat> it's also just hilarious. I mean, someone get me a wiener before I die. And also the idea, when he's doing the play by play, it's one of the funniest scenes ever. And he starts doing it really real. And he goes, his, his fastball snapping off like a fucking firecracker. And then the moment where he goes, is the pitch, he springs, it's a fucking home run. Like the idea of the ball's already got like a home run takes three or four seconds to get out. And he just goes, he swings and it's a fucking home run. It's just so goddamn funny. Someone well, gets me away before I die. And all the, and he starts getting everybody involved. I mean, that's the first huge moment of the movie. And that's, uh, that's another thing that's so interesting about the movie is that like, there are a lot of movies where you show people having fun, right? Right. And this movie, definitely, you have moments where people are really having fun, and it's fun. But it's also the darkest movie ever. It's a, it's a very unique movie that a movie could be so much about the excitement of life while also showing it as such a horrible tragedy. You know what I mean? Right. Like, that's, this movie kind of has it all. You feel the joy of life, and then you also feel the fucking nightmare of it. You know, and that 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 having them those both things in a movie make it so powerful. By the way, all the um, fun moments are sports. It's the baseball, the World Series. I know it's really tough for basketball. me to it's really tough for me to get into it. And then no, fishing. The, uh, yeah, well, fishing. I mean, is that a, I guess that's a sport. That's a sport. Then they're playing games. The other one, so some kind of uh, whatever. And then the other uh, other subtle joke. We got to move on probably, but um, the other great joke is. Um, this is Dr. Scanlon, famous Dr. Scanlon, Dr. Oh, yeah. And then Mr. Harding. Mr. Yeah, it's <laughs> so great. beautiful. Well, uh, that's that what... rivalry is great too throughout the movie. The movie is both like a comedy and a tragedy. And the, the, the fact that it has both of them in it makes it so like, yeah, it's just so powerful. Cause you know, like 
you know, a lot of people love Requiem for a Dream, you know, and I, movies like that. I never I know it's a weird thing to bring up right now. I don't Have you ever seen it? Yes. Movies like that don't really do much for me because you're watching people. There's no joy they're having anyway for them to lose. Mm -hmm. So it just goes from them to have a shitty situation to just worse. But you're never like there's nothing happy that they lost. But in this movie, you see joy that is then lost. You feel the joy and you feel the joy taken away. And and that really makes me feel more close. This movie feels closer to life. Like the writer Bernard Malamud once said, life is a tragedy full of joy. And that's that's what this movie feels like. It, it, you feel the joy and then you feel it get really taken away in a very tragic, you know, moment. And that, yeah, it just makes you feel the, the pain and the beauty of life. It's a masterpiece. I mean, there's just no other. Uh, it's just it's just a fucking amazing. We didn't even movie. talk about how great the, the crazy people are. Like the movie does such an amazing job of like developing them. Yeah. I mean, there's just so much to talk about. We could do a two hour episode of I mean, uh, we. So much about the fishing scene is uh, is amazing, and then all all the poker scenes are great. Danny DeVito's hilarious, and uh, yeah. Chesway Ches is going to ride. Amazing, just like like at one point, just cuts him. He's just crying out of nowhere. It's just like hilarious. Like he's just like his level of emotion he has at every moment. <laughs> he's amazing, and that moment where he's like, "I want my cigarettes." I, and then, my and, cigarettes. <laughs> I, that's so amazing. And then that's one of the great moments in the movie too. Is after that when you know Lloyd's leg catches fire, and then they pull, um, you know, Cheswick out, and it's crazy. And then Nicholson looks over, and Ratchet has that little smile, looking at him, of like, "You see what I'm capable of." That's like one of the great movie moments ever as well. The smile when she. Uh... This is a smile when she has him dragged out. Yes. And it's just complete chaos. Everybody's screaming and then he smashes the glass and takes the thing. And then she's just kind of like has that face of like, huh? There's also another interesting smile she does. That I don't I don't know. I, don't, I was trying to think what it kind of meant. You remember the part where Jack Nicholson comes back pretending to be lobotomized? Yes. There's a moment where she's watching him walk in lobotomized and she almost has like a smile come to her face. I think she then buries. I don't know if you remember it. Like, yeah, yeah. What do you? It was an interesting moment. I was like, a. Maybe, I assume she knows Jack Nicholson wasn't lobotomized. Yeah, she would. Know. So, a maybe Jack Nicholson just kind of made her laugh for once. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. She's uh, either that like, or funny. or somehow she does think he got lobotomized and she's like happy about it. But I think it's more that he just kind of made her laugh for once. It's yeah, a very maybe small moment. Yeah, that's a great moment too. The mental defective league in formation and well, the great. in the foreshadowing the fact that he's going to literally come back like that, actually lobotomized. You know, right? right. Well, the movie has everything. It's like it has this this epic cosmic symbolism. It has a lot of humor, but I think ultimately it's the humor that makes you know, like Easy Rider is a movie that's just all pure symbolism. You know what I mean? No humor. It's all pure abstract symbolism. In this movie has both. It's hilarious. It's a very concrete comedy, but it's also full of abstract mythology about authority and fighting it. You know what I mean? And about like the natural impulses of man and like, and it's, it, it has everything in it. It's like the perfect movie besides it, from little, you know, problematic. Exactly. And on top of that, and this is basically in what you said, but it's also just fun as hell to watch. I mean, there's a lot so of fun. movies that have a lot of great aspects, but you can't, Citizen Kane is amazing, but nobody wants to watch fucking Citizen Kane with a group of friends. Yeah. Once with the Cuckoo's Nest is just you get a group of people together, you watch that and you're everybody's happy. The movie appeals to these your primal emotions of joy and fear and catharsis. It hits all those big emotions. Yeah. You know? Now let's talk about the last detail. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to should we talk about Chinatown? I mean, where do you have time? I got um I got uh like 12, 12 minutes. All right. Let's I mean, see. We, yeah. All right. Let's talk about Chinatown, which I haven't seen in a couple years. Uh, it was sprung on me at the last minute. You hate minute. me? Or, uh... That's the two different questions. <laughs> yes and no. Um, two different questions with two different answers. For sure and definitely not. <laughs> but um, no, Chinatown, another one. I mean, I'm not saying anything uh, new here, but one of the great screenplays of all time, albeit a little confusing for God's sakes. Yeah, some of it doesn't actually, I, I believe with any murder mystery, if you unravel all of the murder mystery, there are things that don't make any sense. Every murder mystery has holes in it. That's just the way it is, you know. Interesting. Now, that's a challenge like, to write a murder mystery with no holes in it, then. 
I think it's impossible because I I just think like by definition a murder mystery is like contrived because you have to have a lot of coincidences and when you look back at it you're like okay well even if it's not a whole it's more of like well that's pretty that's a little too coincidental that that happened right then you know I mean Zodiac's a murder mystery it's one of our favorite movies of all time yeah it really happened except I guess I don't technically it's that's like a real story i mean a murder mystery that's like an actual because it's a little different zodiac there's not like a bunch of people and one of them could be the murderer you know what i mean i mean i guess that is exactly what that's it is. exactly <laughs> the plot. I, I think like i don't think you could describe that movie better <laughs> it's like a bunch of people and then one of them's a murderer but they're trying to figure out which one outside of true stories i mean like a murder like a i understand you know I'm, being I mean. an ass. I'm being an ass tits face <laughs> cunt but i am mad at you but no i mean <laughs> chinatown is an interesting one because this is another movie similar to easy rider in one way in that as a kid everyone was like this is one of the great movies of all time and i was like great and i watched it and i was like i, I don't know what the fuck's going on here i like watching nicholson i like uh, so many things about it but it took me about 12 times to be like okay i think i know what's going on here because there's a lot at play here i mean there's a lot happening and there's characters that are like oh she's my daughter and my mother or whatever the fuck uh i'm her she's my daughter and sister i was raped by my father and you're like jesus christ and then there's all the there's a lot happening there's a lot happening i mean there's basically like you know i think the way he the robert town framed it is like there's the rape of his daughter and the rape of the land, basically. So you have two different kind of things happening. You have all the shit with the the daughter, and then you have this whole other thing with him using uh, the water to uh, dry out places to, you know, basically control the resources, you know. And then, and then, you know, his the his son in law finding that out. But um, yeah, it's a great. I mean, it's a it has one of the greatest. I mean, it has one of the greatest endings of all time. You know, this is the seventies where you could have like a really sad, awful ending. <laughs> Yes, similar to the endings of The Last Detail and Five Easy Pieces. <laughs> but um, no, yeah. And I think Robert Town didn't want, he had a happy ending in mind and Polanski changed yes, it. I know. That's the thing. Like, Chinatown is great. Kind of be, I mean, the movie is really good, but that ending is what makes it the masterpiece it is. And that's all Polanski. And it's also kind of interesting because Polanski is like, no, no, no. The ending should be that the evil guy just gets away with it. And. <laughs> Trust me, that's more true to life that the evil guy (laughs) gets away without consequences. All right. Now that put that in there. Anyway, I got to go to Paris. (laughs) I raped a couple under. I got to go see about a girl, a young girl, (laughs) a very young girl. Did I ever tell you the story? Somebody told me this story. Maybe I've told you. Maybe I've told it on podcast. Maybe I've told it to you, but I forget who it was that told me the story, but maybe it was Alan Havey or somebody that's friends with a lot of actors and is an older guy. Yeah. And I think it was Alan Havey. I'm going to show with him tonight. I'm going to say it was Alan Havey, who's a, a great comic and actor uh, who's in the um, Coen Brothers movie. He's great. Anyways, but he was telling a story. He was at a party or someone he knows was at a party and told this story where um, they were standing with Roman Polanski and there was a party and they're like, look how young that girl is. She looks like she's what, 16? And then he just looked and went, 15. <laughs> like he like, Wait, Roman said that? Roman Polanski did. Yeah, like he sized up this girl and just really deadpan was like 15 and he said everybody was like oh that was weird <laughs> like he was just like he can look and fucking nail an age He's like a bird like, watcher like he yeah says a bird but yeah <laughs> and they were all like 15, wow. 15 and it's like jaws 15 and then you know robert yeah. jaw, 15 and six months <laughs> 20 footer 25 20- three tons of them it's insane like that it took so long for like people to get mad at him like he fled from statutory rape and he still like won an Oscar. But I mean, the movie's great. The pianist. That's the thing. He's like, what he did is so awful. And he's such a great director. Those, I love both Rose- those things. Rosemary's baby is incredible. Rosemary's baby. Yeah. Both those things exist at the same time. He is awful and he is a genius. <laughs> It makes sense. I mean, like, well, why would one prevent the other? Like, why would being a genius storytelling filmmaker make you not able to fuck a 14 year old? You know what I mean? Yeah. If anything, it makes you feel like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess you'd like to think somehow like you'd like to think like because obviously these movies have a lot to do with compassion and oppressed people and humanism. You know, especially Chinatown. It has so much. You know, you'd think that it's coming. But then you got to remember, like he didn't write it. 
He's right. just directing. <laughs> he's just directing it. So it's like, yeah, he's genius. It just so happened that the character he related to was uh, <laughs> John Huston. <laughs> right, right, right. That's funny. But no, like, it's a, this is a it's, great movie about a great protagonist, John Huston. He's <laughs> really related to him. <laughs> It's a great movie, and Nicholson uh, was nominated for Best Actor again and didn't win. And then some people think that The Cuckoo's Nest was a makeup because Chinatown, him not winning, was like a robbery, they thought. I guess, but like, I mean, I have to say, but this ain't this ain't son of a woman. I mean, One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest is just like his vehicle, you know what I mean? Like, he is like... He no, kinda, he's amazing in yeah. that as well. But I guess not, not a makeup, but it was like a... Uh, he's for sure getting it this year. He should have got it last year. He should have got back-to-back. But anyways, he's amazing in Chinatown, and he's in every single scene. There's not a scene he's not in. There's no That's moment where it's not yeah. on him. In fact, even when he's knocked out, it fades to black and fades back in after he's, he's right. woken up. So it's like everything is through his eyes. I forgot how also tough Jack Nicholson is in all his early movies. You know, you kind of forget about it, but he's quite the fighter in everything. Like at one flew over a cuckoo's nest, he seems to be ready to throw down at any time and get beat up. And he always fights and gets beat up. And in Chinatown, he's always ready to fight. There's like five people at him at one point. He's calling them a stupid piece of shit. And he just gets beat up. He's a very fearless act, you know, character. This is very frustrating because in five easy pieces, he tries to fight a guy who just easily controls him and beats the shit out of him. And I've seen the movie and the last detail. I've seen five easy pieces. Oh, OK. Well, he tries to fight the guy, the masseuse there, the I, fucking I don't, male I don't nurse. Remember. I, I just remember the ending. It's very powerful. The endings. It's one of the great endings ever. But and then the last detail, of course, he just goes and picks a fight with a bunch of Marines by himself. And in fact, the last detail I was going to point out. Could have been the same character as Cuckoo's Nest. It's like the same exact character, basically. Mm. Phenomenal movie. Hilarious. Everybody watch it, except for Rana. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Moments pass. But, um, We're doing but, it for the Patreon. But no, um, he's great. And then one of my favorite lines ever, Roman Polanski with his cameo when he slices his nose. Yeah. And uh, Nicholson does the, uh, I almost lost my nose. And I like my nose. I enjoy breathing out of it, which is just so. <laughs> There's so many amazing lines. Uh, does it hurt? Only when, it, only when I breathe. Yes. Um, there's so many. Yeah, there's so many great. That, it's, it's, there's so many great lines. And uh, I mean, the shit with Faye Dunaway, th- that scene at the end between them, the sister daughter moment mm-hmm. is one of the great scenes of all time. Like like I remember Robert McKee, you know, the story guy. The, what? The comedy Robert star? McKee. No, he wrote like um, this book called Story. He, he's like a he's like a guy. He's like a Blake Snyder talks about screenwriting. Oh, OK. No. You ever no. see Adaptation? Yes. Remember, he's Brian Cox in that. Remember, he's reading a book about a guy who's teaching how oh, to okay. make movies. Brian Cox is based on the real guy, Robert McKee. But he always uses that, like, example of that scene of, like, you know, in each scene, there should be, like, different gaps of expectation going from, like, positive feeling to negative feeling. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and that scene has some of the biggest gaps of expectations of all to the point where at the end you realize... You know, she's been, you know, she's been raped and, and that's her daughter, which is such an amazing moment because it also elevates the movie to this whole other level and to like a level of evil that didn't even realize, you know? Yeah. And that's that seems like the main thing in the movie is that everything's much bigger than you realize or yeah. that he realizes. And in a way, it's like it's almost feels like a conspiracy. It's kind of a movie you think a conspiracy theorist would like because it's basically saying it's all rigged and there's nothing you can do about it. Right. Which but, I don't actually agree with in real life, but as a story, I find it quite powerful. And it's also just so fun that noir stuff that I love of just uh, he's a, a, a private dick and the little details of like putting the stopwatch behind the tire and no, then to yeah. go find out like all those little things. And he's also yeah. so like he's so real in this like kind of pathetic way at times. He's both pathetic and tough, but it's, there's a realness to him. Like he, he feels like a a real human being. He gets mad when the other guy at the barber calls him a piece of shit, even though he kind of knows he's a piece of shit. You know what I mean? Right. And he actually is kind of a piece of shit, but like he has like, he just feels like a real fucking flawed human being, you know, not like too great or too bad, you know? Right. Yeah. You just described me perfectly, but <laughs> no, no, it's just great. It's just great fun. And it's, it's twists and it's, it's also beautiful. I mean, like I love that old California, I love yeah. the noir aspect. I love an investigator. Yeah, it's, it's a very and bright. I love uh, rape and incest also. <laughs> it's a very bright noir, too. Like for all the noirs, you know, it's uh, it's all sun. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, the question ultimately is, would it have been as great with that original ending where, like, I think the original ending is she shoots John Huston. Yes. And she goes to jail. 
you know, would that have been a great? I don't think so. I feel like that ending is such a, I mean, the movie's really good, but that ending is like such, it, it like defines the movie. Well, and there's something so beautiful about the, like, it's Chinatown. Like it does just give, feel just like give up. Yeah, just give up. It's life. You know what I mean? It is. It, it's you could replace that with that. That's life, man. You're we're, we're fucked. Just take it and leave. So it's kind of it's kind of a. <laughs> it's not like the people there are from Chinatown. It's a weird thing. There's a forget it. It's Chinatown. It's like <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, they just drove there at the end. That's really more. Forget it. It's John Houston owning everything. I like how even at the end, they're still blaming it on Chinese people. You know, you know what it's like with these fucking Chinese people. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty good point, actually. Yeah, it's not really the Chinese don't really have much to do with it. Well, also, <laughs> and I guess it's just like a metaphor for like or that kind of like, you know, the thing that happened last time. But also like a big flip is also the thing about the accent because the it's kind of the LR joke. That becomes like a big right, right, right. He says bad for the glass, and right. he doesn't know what that means. And at the end, he realizes, oh, he meant grass. Right, that's a good point. <laughs> so it's kind of like, oh, the big twist is that Asians uh, talk funny. <laughs> like, right, right. <laughs> but that's a fun moment too, and the the glass, all, all that stuff is just fun. I mean, those are just fun little moments. Well, it's it's interesting because it's grass, and yet it's also glasses because the glasses are. It, so it's like bad fun. for the glass, but then it kind of reminds him that they found glasses in there. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like because the Asians talk funny, it helped him solve the case. It's Chinatown. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> um, It'd be funny if it like any other movie or something awful happens. Like, forget it. You know, it's Bosnians. You know how it is. It's right, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what? Right. <laughs> Yeah, right. you know how it ends with these Chinese people. It's like I, I feel like it was, that was really a white man who really did everything there. Well, you know. <laughs> um, but no, it's a great movie, and it's another one that's it's just fun. It's fun to watch. I mean, it's not as fun as Cuckoo's Nest. It's not traditional fun, but it's it's. Um, I, I mean, know, fun is a weird. Are, yeah, but murder mysteries are fun. Yeah, I guess it's 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 fun. Uh, it's not you know fireworks and hand jobs and tits. It's not that kind of fun. But it's a it's a rewatchable movie. In fact, you have to rewatch it to fucking figure out what the fuck's going on. By the way, as a kid, I watched it. I, I guess I didn't understand what he was doing. But there's that part where he they're going to the nursing home and go. By the way, do you let Jews in? He's like, oh, of course not. And when you watch it later, you realize he's doing that to get the list of people. He's like, you sure? Can I see the list? Just right. want to make sure, and then he wants to see the list, but I didn't connect that. So as a kid, I just thought I just really wanted to remind you that uh, Jews suck in this moment. <laughs> like it's just like do you have Jew just outside the plot? Do you have Jews here? Hell no! Like it's just like it's just, <laughs> just, just. I mean, I know Roman Polanski's Jewish, but at the time, I was just like, oh, that's just like an interesting minor moment of anti-Semitism for no reason. <laughs> well, it's never a bad time to remind people that Jews are unpleasant. I feel like you're feeling that right now pretty strongly. And uh... <laughs> I was earlier. Now it's you know made up and it's fun. It's fine. But, um, you know, the last detail is just an excellent film that uh, is worth talking about. Well, don't we, we should have a Patreon. Don't we want to make money? I'd love to make money. I enjoy money. I like uh, <laughs> I, I like my nose. I enjoy breathing out of it. By the um, way. You know, I didn't watch the movies, but you know what? I did spend like hours getting that shit on the podcast. So I feel like, you know, I feel like that counts for something. Oh, well, now we're just keeping score with unrelated. <laughs> Is that what you're like in a relationship? <laughs> That's hilarious. You're like, oh, you didn't come to my fucking uh, my, <laughs> my softball game. Uh, yeah, but I did pay rent. One time when I was 10, I bought my friend a copy of uh, War Games and just had the gift out of nowhere. And then I ended up bringing up whatever he got did something I didn't like. I'd be like, but dude, I once bought you war games. I like held it. I like bought her the gift and then held it over him for years and always bring it up. Yeah, we call that scorekeeping. And it's a <laughs> horrible quality. But um, but if you need me, I'll be uploading this podcast to YouTube as I always do. Um, well, I'll be doing the audio and uploading it to the pod. That's great. All right. That seems pretty even. Pretty even, Stephen. And um the artwork costs 300 bucks, and uh, I haven't seen a nickel of that. So I think we can uh, just call it a draw here. <laughs> but anyways, great films <laughs> this week, except for Easy Riders. Let's rank these, because you got to go to a spot. You have to leave early, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're scorekeeping. You're like, uh, you're scorekeeping to, to, you're scorekeeping to attack me for scorekeeping. That's a good point. Well, what's good for the goose is good for the Jew. Um, <laughs> all right, let's rank them. I All mean, right. it's so obvious for me. I mean, mine are just so obvious. I hate one of them. One's my favorite movie ever, and the other one I love. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously yours is yeah, uh, one floor over, and then Chinatown, and then Easy Rider. Absolutely. So that's not fun. Now you, uh, where, where are you though? I don't know. You're one and two. I gotta say, Cuckoo's Nest, you like better. Uh you probably like Chinatown because you're a fucking. I think I like whatever China, you are. I think I like Chinatown better. I think I like. I, yeah, I think I like Chinatown better. I, I love like, look, I love One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest. It's so powerful, but like for me, Chinatown, like most murder mysteries are. There's like four great murder mysteries, you know, outside of Zodiac, you know, and it's like that's one of the best. I think it, I think it's so. It's one of the hardest things to do. To write a great murder mystery, you know. Okay, so it's hard to write, but Cuckoo's Nest makes your hair stand up and makes you laugh. Aren't those the two things you want most out of a film, and not just like ah, that's a high level of difficulty? Yeah, I mean, a goosebump neck stand up. It it, it makes you want to go fucking live, and it makes me cry laughing. Yeah, all right. Chinatown doesn't fine, even come fine. close to either of those. Well, here here's the thing about One Flew Over Cuckoo's Nest. Christopher Lloyd really brings it home at the end. I don't think he gets enough credit for that ending because that's him. I mean, that's like Christopher Lloyd does to that what Roman Polanski does to Chinatown. Like him hooting and hollering in that moment. That really that's what gets the hair up, you know? Exactly. Without that, without if that's not in there. Which, by <laughs> credit to uh, Milos Forman, too. I know, and it's also like he's like, the, he's like the asshole during it, like the whole. He's like the badass, uh, insane person. He's always like just like kind of fucking around, but like his like his sense of joy at the end is so beautifully primal. Um, but Chinatown is a fucking. I don't know. Chinatown is an amazing movie. It is. It just feels like you well, want to be a little you... different. It's the intellectual <laughs> choice. You want to sound cool. They're both fucking intellectual choices. What do you mean? Cuckoo's Nest I mean, over yeah, Chinatown. Like, I mean, it's not like it, it's not like one's more of a film buff movie than the other. Well, Chinatown is All right, a little. You know what? I will say the director of Chinatown did rape five underage women and flee to uh, Paris and never really face consequences. Um, so I guess I have to give it to him for that because that's a pretty. Yeah, Milos would actually. never do that. Both foreign directors, though. Yeah, yeah. I'll, all right, I'll give one flew over cuckoo's nest, and then uh, and then Chinatown, and then uh, I'll, I'll. You know what? Especially since I didn't see the other two movies, that let me score keep the other way. Are we good Thank on you. score? If I if I put it that way, are we good? Yeah, that's great. I appreciate it. Because I'm gonna get I'm gonna get all these fucking comments. You fucking didn't do your homework, you stupid Jew. This Why am I giving tough. them ideas? <laughs> I think they could have come up with that. <laughs> Why are they giving the brilliant Aaron Sorkin lines like fucking Jim? <laughs> All right. All right. This is a great one. All right. Go do your This is really good. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to go, uh, you know, masturbate in the hotel room. I'm going to see and, Alan. Uh, I'll ask him about that story. Oh, Alan Havy. Oh, yeah. Please yeah. do. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, he's going to be like, what? I never fucking heard of that. <laughs> he's got a million stories. He's got a million great old. What Coen Brothers movie was he in? He's in Hail Caesar. Oh, he plays okay. like the uh, the priest. He, uh, every time I see him, I'm like, that guy looks so familiar. And I can't, like, I don't know if it's, I feel like he was in a curb once or there's something. He's in a Seinfeld. Like, what Seinfeld is it? He's what? in Seinfeld where Kramer has the tight jeans on. Like they're painted on. He's the cop at the end in the interrogation where he's like, I said, sit down. And Kramer can't sit because the jeans are too tight. Ah, uh, yeah. It, it, yeah. I mean, I, I know that scene, but it, it's one of those things. You ever have an actor that's so familiar looking? But every time you look through his work, there's not one thing that were like, that was it. Yes, exactly. I do that all the time. That's what I have with Alan Havy. I've looked through his IMDb and I'm like, I know all those things, but I there wasn't. I feel like there was one movie well, that did it and I can't find it. Mad Men. It might be Mad Men. He's in Mad Men. But he's a, it's a smaller part than I thought. Like, I thought, like, yeah, it's one of them. But anyway, um, all, all right, right, I got to go, go. So you're not late like yeah, you were geez. for this. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. All right. See you later. Bye.